Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Before we reintroduce the podcast, founder Jeff Gordet and I created a survey for our subscribers to give their feedback on how we could improve the podcast and also what you would like to see in the future of the podcast. I have listened to your responses and tried to reach out to as many of the guests as possible. Of course, a few patterns emerged within the survey, and we found some guests were requested over and over again. However, the guest that was by far the most popular was my guest today. This confused me a little at first, and he'd actually already been on the podcast twice. It was only once I listened to his two episodes that I could see why. He was absolutely fascinating and such a pioneer within our running world. I loved his approach, and he is the kind of person that you could go to a lecture listening to and actually enjoy listening to what they have to say. I then knew I had to bring him back on the show. Not only did you want him, but now I had all these questions that I wanted to ask. I was sure you would be curious about them too. My guest today is Matt Fitzgerald. Matt is the author of over 20 books, including Racing Weight, Brain Training for Runners, Diet Cults, and most recently, his 80-20 running book. You'll also hear about what he has planned for the end of the year. He is also a writer for a number of publications, including Men's Fitness, Men's Health, Outside, Shape, Stuff, and Women's Health. Matt is certified by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. He has served as a consultant to numerous sports nutrition companies, and serves as a training intelligence specialist for pair sports. Matt is an endurance sports coach, and he is now the Cherry Marketing Institute ambassador. Some of the topics Matt and I are going to discuss today include why there is no one right way to eat, especially when it comes to choosing a particular diet, the importance of having a healthy relationship with food, the psychology behind why we tend to put ourselves in the moderate intensity level within our running, even when we know we need to run easy, three ways you can measure to see if you are running at the right threshold to allow for recovery, and the importance of developing power as a runner and how you can use it to become faster at every distance. So that's enough from me. Let's meet Matt. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Matt. Great to be with you. It's great to have you. This is my first time of talking to you, but I know that uh, you have been on our show twice before, so I guess that's uh, where we will begin. So um, we talked to you last year, I think it was either May or June, but what have you been up to since then? Uh, Busy as usual. (laughs) Um, You know, writing is always uh, priority number one with me. I'm... uh, it's my my n- number one passion, probably the only thing I'm good at, um, and I I never run out of ideas. So uh, I've um, had a book published, I guess, since the last time I talked to you, called Eighty Twenty Running, um, and then I'm putting the finishing touches on another one called How Bad Do You Want It? Uh, that'll be published at the end of the year. Okay, very interesting. Looking forward to that, and we will talk about Eighty Twenty in just a few minutes, but. Um, I want to go over a few things from a previous interview that at the time I remember you were talking about and I wish um, we would have had more, you would have dug into that topic a little deeper. So if it's okay with you, I just want to go back to that a little bit more. Um, I'm sure our listeners will also be interested to hear. So um, you talked about um, from your book, Diet Cults, about um, how we have an ability as humans to kind of thrive on any diet if we do it right, and we can be equally as healthy on any diet. So could you kind of expand on that a little bit, as I found that absolutely fascinating? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I would say not any diet. You know, there, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> yeah. there, are, there, are, there are rules you cannot get away with breaking. But, you know, uh, humans are nature's ultimate omnivore. Um, so we've, we've made ourselves adaptable um, just in a, you know, and in, in, ages long process of uh, expanding our diet. So we are we actually are dependent on a diverse diet. There's no single food that we can eat exclusively like koala bears can do with eucalyptus leaves. You know, we need variety, but there's also a, a broad framework that we can operate within. You know, 
there are all these diets that are based on some kind of magical macronutrient ratio. You know, you have to hit 40, 30, 30 or 60, 20, 20 or whatever it is in order to be healthy. And that, that's simply not true. And this isn't my opinion. I mean, it's just there's loads of science demonstrating uh, that you can, you know, switch from a, you know, a, a higher protein diet to a higher carb diet and back again. And, you know, maybe after a little period of adjustment, you know, really, truly be equally healthy on both. Um, and then it's not just macronutrients either. You can look at, you know, food types. You can prioritize, uh, you know, animal-based foods. Um, you know, they, they probably all need to come from, uh, you know, whole natural sources. Um, but, you know, it, you can have more of a, a plant-based diet, more of a, a meat-based diet. And again, uh, be more or less equally healthy on both. So you said that um, you've, you've uh, you know, this isn't just you saying this. So there is research out there that kind of, you know, demonstrates this? Yeah, I mean, I, I am not competent to form my own opinion <laughs> about, you know, about, you know, the rules of healthy eating for, for humans. I was an English major in college, you know. So, you know, all of us who aren't really doing the research ourselves, we're really in the same position. It's a matter of whom do you trust, mm -hmm. you know. Definitely. Um, and, you know, that there's an art to that. Um, and, and I think that is what I, I trust myself in being able to judge whom to listen to, who, who I think are the, the researchers that I, I want to invest my faith uh, in, you know, because they're even at the Ph.D. level. There are some differing opinions. You know, I think there are some true clowns and outliers out there who I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw them. Uh, but, you know, I think there is sort of a, a core mainstream um, of you know nutrition scientists who who believe just that um and I, I quote a few in, in diet cults that mm -hmm. that that human beings that there is no you know one one right way for humans to eat so if that's the case why do you have a theory on why we keep coming back to you know go we get seem to cycle through these diets or even even just fads of you know within running um we seem to cycle through the, all these different you know like you said high carb um, low carb, high fat. Like, why? Why is it we we're kind of all or nothing in our attitude towards eating? You know, the main reason, in in my view, and this is really what diet cults explores, is, is that um, humans define their identity, um, individual, cultural, and moral, uh, in large measure based on what they do and don't eat, and wh whom they choose to eat like, and whom they choose not to eat like. Uh, we can't help it. You know, we've got these big brains with all this language power and um, and interpretive power, and we use it uh, in defining our relationship with food. So that's what's going on. It's something, if you look back at history, we've always done. As long as there has been culture, there has been food culture um, and, and a pattern of using and theming, you know, based on, you know, diets. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just our, our kind eats this way, your kind eats another way, and we're better because of it. Uh, you know, that's, it's ancient and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of primitive in a way, but you know, there's no off switch for it. We're still doing it today. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we, we don't do that and we kind of, or do you think, like you said, it's just human nature and it's always kind of, we're always going to be looking for the next best thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, who knows what we're going to be up to as a species in 500 years, you know, <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't see any immediate, uh, transcendence of, of that pattern forthcoming no mm -hmm. so do you just try to yourself you try to eat wholesome foods you know fresh um i'm i'm guessing maybe local try and just make sure that you know real foods rather than processed packaging but for that for the most part is that what you would recommend yeah you know my my diet is you know pretty normal looking um especially on the surface um and uh and it, I really just have kind of high overall quality standards uh, for what I eat. But, you know, I have no forbidden food groups, mm -hmm. uh, you know, no demonized macronutrients or micronutrients. Um, you know, I eat normal stuff. You know, I eat cold cereal for breakfast. I grew up doing it. I like it. It's familiar. Um, and I still do it. Not not every morning, but I just, you know, I'm not eating Fruit Loops anymore. You know, it's, you know, it's whole grain, low sugar, organic milk. Uh, lots of fresh berries thrown in, um, and you know, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really like that actually, and uh, I I do remember you saying that in in previous interviews, and that kind of that was good for me to hear because you know we we hear about you know everything in moderation, yet it seems almost contradictory that we hear everything in moderation, yet at the same time you're not supposed to eat this, you're not supposed to eat that. So I I like that you kind of 
like you said, you have a well rounded uh, view on things. And I've kind of always believed that myself, like, even though I run at quite a high level, I've always thought, you know, you, you, that doesn't mean you don't get to eat a burger, or it doesn't get mean you don't, you shouldn't have a, you know, some chocolate or something. It's, if you do it in moderation, I always found, I don't know if you've ever experimented with this, but when I cut things out completely, that's when I struggle with it more and I'm trying to almost fill the void. So it's nice to hear that you kind of believe in uh, a well-rounded approach. Yeah, actually, your your experience with, with that is scientifically validated. I mean, there's research showing that that's exactly the case. The, a person, the person who's more likely to eat a whole box of cookies is not the person who allows himself or herself to have one cookie every day. It's the person who tries to never eat a cookie. You know, that mm-hmm. that's just a fact. So, you know, one of the things that it's kind of one of the, it, it's a, I, I keep pounding this drum and I'll never stop. You know, the psychological side of food and eating is just as important as the physical side. And there's no real separation. Um, I like to say that uh, you need to eat healthy food, and you need to have a healthy relationship with food. If you don't have, if you don't have both, uh, you're not you're not where you should be. You know, there there are plenty of people I encounter in my practice as a sports nutritionist who have on paper healthy food, but they don't have the healthy relationship. And guess what? They suffer problems. If, if they're athletes, they're not training well. They're not they're, you know they're not um, they're getting injured. They're getting sick. Um, so you know you need both the psych- the psychology is critical yeah and especially i think now isn't uh orthorexia actually a uh uh is scientifically proven or whatever it is to uh <laughs> to be um a disorder now is that right uh yeah it, explain a bit about that as you probably know more about it than me yeah um and i guess you know it it, it remains controversial and there's mm-hmm. the whole there's the whole undercurrent of um you know, the, the DSM, the diagnostic manual for, uh, you know, psychology or psychiatry keeps expanding and expanding. And the idea is like, okay, everything's a disorder. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I get that. But, you know, whatever orthorexia is, uh, which is basically just an obsession with eating healthy, it's real enough to me just on, uh, you know, it, uh, on an experiential level, mm-hmm. you know, I see it and, and there's, there's something there for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you talked about that. Cause yeah, I did think that was interesting, um, that that had been brought up, uh, in the manual, but at the same time, like you said, is it, um, is it really enough to, is it really, um, a point, are we at the point where everything is a disorder, but at the same time, yes, that kind of is, um, an obsession. <laughs> Sorry, oh. I went a roundabout way of saying that. <laughs> um, so let's uh, move on to your uh, your latest book, which has been released. Uh, I like I said, I am interested to hear about the one coming out at the end of the year. But um, about, do you want to tell us, tell our listeners just a little about uh, your eighty twenty book? Yeah, so eighty twenty running is really intended to address the single most common mistake that not just runners, but all endurance athletes make in their training, uh, which is uh, doing too much of their training at, at a physiologically moderate intensity, um, not enough at low intensity and not enough at high intensity, but especially not enough at low intensity. The, the typical you know, recreational endurance athlete, and by that I really mean recreationally competitive endurance athlete, non-elite endurance athlete, um, mm-hmm. is... Uh, you think you're at a low intensity, and in fact, you're at a moderate intensity. It's, kind of, it's I call it intensity blindness, um, and it's extremely pervasive, and it holds runners uh, and other athletes back a lot more than than they would think. Yeah, we've actually gone into that. I'm not sure if you have seen. Uh, we actually published an article a few weeks ago um, that found uh, they did. It was a study. I'm not sure you may have even used this study within your book, um, but it found they put people into two groups. Uh, a high intensity group where 65% was easy, 25% moderate, and 10% high. And they had a low intensity group where 80% was easy, and 20% was split between moderate and high. And they found that the first group improved by 2 minutes and 37 seconds, and the second group improved by 2 minutes and 1 second. So, you know, that's a pretty significant uh, difference there. Um uh, wait, I may have that the wrong way around there. <laughs> okay. but 
flip, you flipped it, but yeah, yeah. You, get it. <laughs> you get what I was trying to say that the uh, the low intensity group where they did eighty percent easy improved by over thirty seconds more than the group that did um, the high intensity training, which I thought was interesting. Do you have a theory behind why why that is, or did you find that in your research? Yeah, so you know, the study you cited was uh, conducted by uh, Jonathan Esteve Lanao, uh, a, a, a Spanish researcher and coach. Uh, it was actually his club runners who were the subjects of that study, okay. and an American based in Norway named Steven Seiler. Steven Seiler is actually the guy who coined the 80-20 rule as it applies to endurance sports. So, um, yeah, those two gentlemen are all over m- my book. It's you know, it's largely their research, um, and so you know. The, the question you just asked me, why, you know, why is easier, better that I asked them that, that question, that's one that they're really, that's going to be sort of the next focus of their research. They, they've really done a great job of demonstrating that, that 80, 20 intensity balance is optimal for athletes of all levels from beginners right up to the elite level. Now it's, now it's why, um, what, what, uh, what Steven Seiler explained to me is that there's this critical, critical threshold, um, not not the more familiar lactate threshold, but the lesser known ventilatory threshold, which is just a little bit lower. Uh, that's where the, that's where scientists put the uh, the borderline between low and moderate intensity. And the reason it's crucial is that if you're just a little bit below that threshold, um, your your nervous system doesn't experience a lot of stress. You get a training effect if you're a little bit below it. It still it still counts as exercise. It'll make you fitter. But the recovery from that lower intensity is very quick. But if you go just a little bit above that ventilatory threshold, uh, yes, it's more of a stimulus for uh, improved fitness, but it, it, it's exponentially more stressful. So it takes a, it's a lot harder for your ner- nervous system to recover from that. So it, you know you have to go above that threshold sometimes. But um, it's, it's a bang for your buck type of thing. Um, overall, what 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 uh, researchers are finding is that if you just do a lot of stuff below the threshold and make you know quick little forays above it, that's really the ideal balance, so that you're getting uh, you know really really well rounded fitness building stimulus, but you're containing the stress. Yeah. And there, there's other research showing that uh, that there are really uh, specific signs that your body is experiencing a lot more stress when you do kind of a, an intensity based approach to training. So what kind of signs would those be? Um, well, uh, hormonal disruptions, okay. uh, primarily like uh, norepinephrine, uh, used to be called nor- noradrenaline. If those levels spike, um, especially like, uh, you know, right after, after workouts, like, like, so if you do two different training programs, one's 80, 20 and one's interval based, and after you know several weeks on either of those programs, you do a high intensity workout. If your norepinephrine levels are a lot higher uh, in one circumstance versus the other, that's a sign that your body um, ha- is under more stress. It's it's having a harder time handling the, the training load you're subjecting it to. Interesting, interesting. Um, and then, so if this is the if this is the case, why why do you think? Um, we have such a difficult time, you know, you would think that getting just below that level, that would be the the kind of running level where we feel good. You know, that's, that's the level, if you're saying, you know, once you get above that level, you're kind of stressing your body out. And um, I'm not sure if we can kind of tell that we are putting our body under a lot more stress, but you would think that the lower level is where we would enjoy it because, you know, you're comfortable, you're, you're relaxed, you're, stress-free so why do you think we have such a difficult time with that trying to stay in that zone yeah that, that's a really interesting question and um what's going on is that uh when 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 people people self-regulate their their intensity of exercise based on perception of effort just that you go by feel and there's lots of research showing this you take a bunch of college kids and put them on exercise machines and say choose your own pace um, or you you look at uh, bicycle commuters and you s- strap heart rate monitors on them and figure out what pace they're just voluntarily choosing on their own to go at. And initially, scientists who did this kind of research, they expected to find that physiology was really determining self-selected exercise intensity. So like maybe everyone was going at 60% of VO2 max or whatever. 
But they didn't find that. They found that the, the physiology is not the same uh, between different exercise modalities. But what is consistent across the board is that people choose the same level of perceived effort. On, on the classic Borg scale that goes from 6 to 20, uh, people are, are, are they're honing in on 12.5 which is smack in the middle of that scale. So yeah. just going by feel, people choose a, a sort of a moderate intensity. Um, my theory about why people do that is that w when, you, when you just go out the door and go for a run of a certain distance, like an unstructured workout, it's just, you know, I'm going for a run. It's six miles, it's 45 minutes, it's whatever it is. You have two competing objectives that influence, uh, you know, the pace you select. One is you want to get it over with. Because, you know, humans are very naturally task oriented. You know, if you have a pile of wood you need to chop, you want to get the wood chopped, right? You don't want to dilly dally and be out there all day. Uh, the same thing with a workout. You know, it's like even though you may love being a runner, I don't care. I've been running my whole life. I still want to get every run I do over with. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a task. You want to check the box, get, get yeah. the workout done, yeah. shower, shower, grab a beer. So, you know, getting it over with means it's pushing you to go faster, right? Mm -hmm. And I understand that if it's a time-based workout, it's the same time no matter what. But, you know, these instincts evolved a lot way before we had stopwatches. Yeah. So we still think in terms of, like, covering distance, getting to the finish line, getting it over with. That makes us want to go faster. However, there's a contrary instinct that we bring into those, those same workouts, which is that we don't want to suffer. And the faster you go, the more you suffer – so the part of you that wants to get the workout over with is making you go, you go faster. The part of you that doesn't want to suffer is making you go slower. When you compromise between those two competing instincts, guess what? 12.5. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. That's, that's interesting because when you were going through between 1 and 20 and you were talking about it, I was, I was, say, I was thinking in my head 11, 11, and I, w I wasn't quite there, but <laughs> um, that is, it would make sense. And also, you know, then you, you finish a run and you feel good about yourself. You know, I, I, I did a good workout. I had, a, got, you know, the blood pumping, the endorphins are rushing around. And, but at the same time, like you said, you're not putting yourself through suffering. But I think uh, something, you know, if you – like you mentioned earlier, if you're just doing, um, if you're not doing specific hard workouts, you can probably get away with it for the most part. Is that correct? But if you're doing, you know, if you are doing these intense workouts, but then the next day, you know, even if it's just intense for your level, it, but the next day you're, you're putting yourself at, the, let's say that 12.5 level, that's when you're going to really struggle. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that this, this problem of, you know, getting stuck in the moderate intensity rut, as I call it, is so pervasive and so hard for people individually to overcome is that you still improve that way. You know, it's like, it's not like you shatter into a million tiny pieces. Mm -hmm. if, if you get the intensity balance, you know, suboptimal, you still improve. You, re you referred to that study. It's like both groups improved, yeah. right? But just one improved more. So if you never do it the other way, if you never do the 80-20 way, you'll never know that you could be getting more benefit from exactly the same amount of time you spend exercising. So you, you think, hey, I'm getting better. Why, you know, why it ain't broke, why fix it? Yeah, good point, good point. Do you have any specific tips for people who are maybe, they're kind of listening to this and thinking of oh, maybe that's me, that any ways that they can kind of ignore that instinct to get it over with and ways they can... You know, you know, we hear about um, have, you should be able to have a conversation. You should be able to, you know, I always like to think when you finish a run, you should be able to say, OK, I could do that all over again. But do you have any specific tips for people who are trying to find that balance of where they are recovering? Yeah, I mean, step one is definitely to recalibrate your perception of effort and learn what the difference between a physiologically low intensity and a physiologically moderate intensity actually is um because uh, trust me like almost everyone below the elite level does this that you, you you need that that correction so um you know uh that it, it's you, you start to get into numbers you know because that's what 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 this threshold is based on so for the average um already trained runner um this threshold, the ventilatory threshold, falls at about 77% of your maximum heart rate, um, but there will be some variability there. Uh, so 
you know, you just need to find where your ventilatory threshold is. The, the, so you can have like a, you know, you can go to an exercise lab and have a lactate threshold test done. Uh, they, can, they can determine your ventilatory threshold in that same kind of test. And horseshoes and hand grenades are, are fine with this. It, it doesn't need to be absolutely precise. In fact, a lot of people don't realize if you had a lactate threshold done every day for a week, you'd get a different result every time. Really? <laughs> so even in a lab, it's not, you know, it'll be close, you know what I mean? <laughs> but based on what you ate, how well you slept, how well recovered you are, you know, it's like, it's different every day. So, you know, no need to get to, precision is overrated in endurance training is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, you know, the do-it-yourself method is fine. And, and yes, um, uh, you should be able to, the talk test is legit. Like you should be able to uh, comfortably speak in full sentences. Uh, if you can, you're below the ventilatory threshold. If you can't, you're, you're above it. Um, and you can also do, uh, um, uh, you, you know, like you can do a self test to determine your lactate threshold heart rate. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have with pair sports, I actually have a workout. It's a do it yourself protocol based on, uh, work by a German researcher where it's perceived effort based. So you just start a workout at, I use a one, one to 10 scale. Your lactate threshold is going to be around six and, uh, your ventilatory threshold is going to be sort of between five and six on that. Um, so you just start off at one and incrementally increase your pace, note your heart rate every time. And when you get to, uh, six, you note your heart rate and that's your lactate threshold. Uh, and then you can calculate, you know, different training zones based on, on that. So, uh, there, there are a few different ways to do it. You can also do a time trial type of test. Um, and you can, uh, you know, with that, you can also, uh, determine your ventilatory threshold pace because a lot of us like to train by pace, um, so, uh, you know, you can use perceived effort, um, you can use heart rate, you can use, uh, pace, all those things to kind of try triangulate. And then once, once you know with the numbers where that threshold really is, then of course you can start paying attention to what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And you'll, and I can guarantee when you're just below that threshold, you will think you're barely moving, you know, <laughs> it'll be ridiculously easy. Not that it's necessarily, uh, this is something that it, it's, um, uh, uh, an impression that that this whole discussion often leaves people with that uh, is erroneous. It's not that you're that you're the, the typical runner is not currently running two minutes per mile too fast in their easy runs. They're probably twenty seconds per mile too fast. So it's not like you have to just you know completely put the brakes on yourself yeah. eighty percent of the time. But those twenty seconds per mile are crucial. Oh yeah. Definitely. And um, with when you said about the pair sports, uh, can people go to that website if I put a link to it in our show notes so they can kind of help determine that themselves? Or is that something they would need to visit um, to determine? Yeah, so pair is a, you know, you can go to pairsports.com. Okay. Pair is a smartphone app. Um, okay. So the, the download is free. You just need um, uh, some type of, to, to, to use this, uh, the, the, uh, do it yourself lactate threshold test you need a heart rate monitor mm -hmm. and it has to be bluetooth based yeah. so if you already have one the app is free it takes 20 minutes to do it um it's not even all that hard it's not like doing a, a race or a vo2 max test okay good good and i did i did like that you mentioned uh you know about it only being uh around like you said 20 seconds or something relatively small because i know a lot of people that are concerned with going too slow is you know don't want other people to think oh look how slow they're moving right. and, it, and it, it is, you know, we all have that kind of ego within us that we want people to think we're fast. And um, But I, I, I don't know about you, but I find when I see other people running, it, it almost makes me feel guilty for not running. So it's more an insecurity within the people uh, looking at the runner rather than the runner themselves. They're not necessarily looking and pointing at that person. So um, I think it's good that you mentioned, you know, we're not talking about a huge jump here, just a, something that's going to make a big difference, but not in the grand scheme of things, it's very little change. Yeah, um, there's a difference, there's a difference between slow and low intensity. They're yeah. you know they're not they're not exactly the same thing. There's obviously a degree of overlap, but uh -huh. heck, you know Mo Farah, he can run five thirty miles and be at low intensity. So that's not slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so definitely depends on the person. It's so, relative. Yes. So are you good yourself at running easy? Do you, are uh, you able to listen to yourself now after this? Yeah. You know what? You know, what's really interesting is that, um, you know, I, I, 
you know, I have a good pedigree um, in terms of like how I was taught to train as a runner. You know, I started young. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had um, good coaches. And so, you know, I learned how to train right. Um, I'm also not a bad runner and it actually is easier for more, more gifted runners to run at low intensity because you can actually run kind of fast and you're still at low intensity. So you get, you get the exhilaration of getting to move right along. Uh, you know, I'm over 40 now, so I'm slowing down, <laughs> but, but that does, it actually does, it does help, um, uh, to be like just a naturally faster runner. Uh, cause then you can, you can kind of have it both ways. Yeah. So for, the, for those reasons, I, I was never one of those people who was caught in the moderate intensity rut. However, when I started to get interested in this, in this research, um, I did actually slow myself down. Yeah. You know, I just figured, you know, you know, what, what the heck? So, you know, I, I went from, you know, maybe at the upper spending 80, 80% of my time at the upper end of low intensity to just kind of easing back and not pushing against that threshold as much. And it, it really has made a difference. Um, also, in my case, I'm, I'm very injury prone. Uh, my body just does not like the repetitive impact of running. So one of the things I've had to do just, you know, to customize my own approach to training is do a lot of cross training. Um, and a lot of it just for convenience is actually walking. Um, it's a little pathetic because I live in California with beautiful weather, but I, I own a treadmill and I spend a lot of time on it. I, I, I crank up the, the gradient to the max 15%, you know, put it at a decent speed. And, um, you know, I, I spend about twice as much time doing that, even sometimes three times as much time doing that as I do running. And I read and my heart rate is pathetically low on it, mm -hmm. but you know what, when I, when I go out and race, and again, I'm not as young as I used to, to be, but um, I can't imagine I would be getting better race results if I if I trained harder. So there's really a lot of room. You know, I, I'm, I'm a living example that, you know, you can really take it easy. Don't, don't get me wrong. I do some ball busting workouts mm -hmm. too. I, I love running fast and I take advantage of that 20% that I'm allowed. But my easy is really easy now. Um, yeah. And it's, it just really has made me more a, of a believer. Yeah, no, I think that's good that you bring that up. And especially with the cross training aspect, you know, we, we hear more and more the importance of it. But I think we're still kind of a little afraid of it. And I, I, you know, I'm very guilty of that myself. But especially I'm glad you said about walking. We have actually uh, posted an article, which I will put on the show notes, which I guess I could mention now, which will be... Uh, runnersconnect.net forward slash rc54 um but this uh we talk about not shunning the walk run method for beginners and uh how you know walking can be a good part of cross training and especially like you said if you put it up at a you know high gradient so that you are walking um you know you're getting your legs moving and getting some uh some difficulty in there um but it's good that you brought that up and i think also you mentioned before didn't you that you have an elliptigo do you still use that a good amount yep i sure do so you know i really like variety you know i mm -hmm. i have I, I used to do a lot of triathlons so I, you know I, i've gotten into cycling I, so i still ride my bike i'm friends with the guys who make the elliptigo so okay. um, that's how i i got on board with that you know in san diego where i used to live you know everyone's got one well not everyone but a lot of people so you, you don't feel quite as goofy where I, where I live now out in the country. I definitely stand out a bit, but I don't care. I just, uh, you know, I, I, I'm out there on it. It's great training. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I like, I like to mix it up because I, I can only run every other day. So I, I only run actually three to four times a week. Um, but I work out twice a day, yeah. you know, just doing all that other stuff. Okay. Well, that's good for people to know that, you know, you don't necessarily have to, you know, run 90 miles a week, run, you know, I get a lot of questions about doing two a days. Um, and you know, uh, for running that is, but you know, there's, there's so many other ways you can get in your fitness and get stronger without actually having to run twice a day or, you know, run 15 miles a day. So that's, that's good to hear that, you know, you can run fast and, you've you've seen it plenty of ways and yet you found that's what works best for you and there's there's nothing wrong with that so that that's good to know um so i want to kind of along those lines with um different cross training exercises you talk uh about lifting weights and how um you've kind of realized the importance of that recently so could you go into that just a little for us yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I've, I've lifted weights since I was a teenager, okay. um, and in fact, uh, throughout college, that's all I did. I, I, I burned out on running, stopped, and became like a real gym rat, meathead <laughs> type of guy. So, 
um, you know, I actually developed uh, a fondness for for pumping iron. Um, so, and I think that's a real advantage because a lot of runners, I mean, let's face it, we're runners because we like running <laughs> yeah. and lifting weights is about as different as you can get. So it helps if you, if you actually like it. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's tough to fit it in. And um, even if you like it, you probably don't like it as much as running. So I've really just over time, and especially as a coach where I'm, you know, initially I would say, well, this is the way you're supposed to do it. So do it. But I got so much pushback that I, for all these reasons, I've, I've developed a kind of a minimalist approach to strength training. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you just don't want to put a lot of thought into, you know, developing this complex, complex periodized, like super rational, multi-phase, you know, strength training program. It's like, you know, more power to the, you know, the, the people who can, can actually develop those plans and, and they know what they're talking about, but you can get so much more. It's so much better than nothing <laughs> to do like a super simple, like, you know, at this point I do the same darn session Every time I go to the gym, I, you know, every now and then I'll learn about a new exercise and, and, and throw it in. But it, I, I go three times a week and it takes 25 minutes uh, okay. to just, just like a, a circuit. And, uh, you know, it's so much better than nothing. You know, you can just be, you just get in there, you're efficient, you, you're very selective with the movements uh, you choose. Um, and it's good enough. And it, it's just, uh, on the on the mental side, it's just it's it doesn't take a lot of motivation. It doesn't take a lot of mental energy or planning. You just you just do it and reap the benefits. Yeah, and do you have some heavy lifting in that, uh, like with big weights, or is it mostly body weight stuff? Uh, I I and, until very recently I was doing, and I will go back to it. I kind of I do a little bit of phasing. Like I just ran a marathon, so I'm I'm kind of yeah. in recovering and rebuilding mode now. Um, and then, I, so I will f- probably phase in some squats and dead, deadlifts and stuff. Um, but, uh, before the marathon, I actually switched to just an entire, entirely kind of corrective body balancing, uh, approach. So, you know, I, because I have lifted weights for so long, I do have kind of a reserve of, of strength that's just kind of there. So because I'm so injury prone, I thought, you know what, let me just, uh, just, there's a temptation again it's not that different from the moderate intensity rut where it's like i've got to get something out of this mm-hmm. right yeah it's like this, it doesn't count if it's so too easy you can do the same thing in the gym where it's like you know unless i'm doing some heavy lifts i'm not really you know getting any benefit from the strength training and and i i suffered from a little bit of that myself but so for maybe like the last 10 or 12 weeks before the marathon i was doing all just uh, you know, body weight stuff, just really focusing on the core and the hips and, and the glutes and, you know, the little crazy muscles in the front of your shins that never get <laughs> any work at all. Just trying to become like really balanced and, and stay healthy. It's the hardest thing in the world for me to just get to the starting line of yeah. a marathon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they say that with uh, most people and uh, I'm sure, um, it, well, like you said, if you are injury prone, even more so. But yeah, getting to the starting line healthy, especially when you are trying to you know, push your body to um, a point where maybe the limit or, you know, close to it, it becomes very difficult. So that's, that's good. And um, you did say in your book about um, strength being one of the components of speed. Um, can you explain that just a little so that people see, you know, it's not necessarily uh, these muscles are going to slow you down, they're actually probably going to help you? Yeah, so speed is really power. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take, you know, like the fastest hundred meter sprinter in the world, that person actually can't move his legs faster than anyone else. He's able to generate more power. Uh, so yes, he can move his legs fast, but he can also, uh, shorten his muscles very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, power is speed and strength put together. So strength is half of power and power is speed. So you can see, you know, that it strength really feeds into, uh, speed. So, you know, if, if you, if you want to get faster, um, uh, being stronger helps, um, you know, as a distance runner, you're not looking to add, uh, a whole bunch of muscle mass, but yeah. you can, you can develop strength without, uh, developing mass. Though I would, I would, I would emphasize actually that, um, as as a distance runner, you're really not trying to get faster in the sense of increasing your your top end speed because proper 
like really proper effective endurance training slows you down. It, 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 it takes, uh, it takes your top gear off and there's no way around that because the physiology of maximum marathon fitness contradicts the mm-hmm. physiology of maximum 100 meter. It, you have to choose one or the other, yeah. you know, yeah. just like if you, if you train for the hundred meter dash, you'll actually become a worse marathoner than you were before you started. Right. And that's okay. You're, you're specializing. So it's really all about preserving speed. You, you, it's okay to give up, you know, the, the very, very top end. Uh, but you want to hold on to as much, to much as you, as you can without failing to train specifically for what you're, for what you're training for. Huh. Yeah, that's, I, I guess that's true, but I hadn't really thought about that. And does that, uh, that just makes me think about, have you got any insight or any thoughts on, you know, a lot of people when they do a marathon segment and they then go back to the lower end of things, you know, 5k, 10k, they find that they actually run faster because they have, um, once they get the speed back, they've kind of developed that strength and kind of almost the other way as well. If you've done, you know, a speed segment or a 5k, 10k um, segment of training and then you move up to the marathon, you've, you've picked up that speed again. And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, I, I go back to Arthur Lydiard's attitude toward this, you know, like the, uh, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Arthur, Lydiard, <laughs> Arthur Lydiard invented the way we train today, uh, yeah. a New Zealand coach from the fifties and sixties and seventies and eighties and nineties. And, uh, <laughs> <So funny. laughs> But, but his, his thought, you know, at his time, intervals were king, you know, in the 50s when he was developing his method. And his insight was, you know what, I'm already plenty fast enough. It's like uh, a four minute mile is 470, uh, 460 second quarters. It's like anyone can run a 60 second quarter. I don't need to get faster. I just need to not die when yeah. I'm trying to sustain that pace. Yeah. Um, so that's what you're seeing when you, when you get fit for a marathon and you build all this endurance and aerobic capacity, and then you go back down to a shorter, shorter distance. It's just like that, that same speed that you had, you know, 5k race pace is nowhere near your maximal sprint speed, nowhere near it, (laughs) but you, you got the speed that's there. But you know, if you, if you suddenly have all this uh, fatigue resistance is what it really is. This just capacity to not get tired as fast running at that aggressive sub maximal speed, you know, amazing things happen. You know, just volume is just, you know, if you've never done it, if you're a runner out there listening to this and you've never tried to train a lot, <laughs> treat yourself. <laughs> it's, it, you know, you have to build up slowly, but it's amazingly powerful. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I'm glad you mentioned build it up slowly because we don't want anyone going out tomorrow and trying to knock out the next five days, five twenty mile runs or something like no. that. But <laughs> you've got to be patient. You know? Yeah, yeah, and that takes some time, and um, it's all a all a learning curve. And then um, just uh, to go back just for a moment to um, the strength, um, and you said about power how that can um, enhance your running economy as well, which, you know, this is becoming more of a focus within the running world as, you know, your your form. And we've done a few um, podcasts and various articles on, you know, you don't have to worry about heel striking. You don't have, there's, you know, some components that people focus on too much that you don't have to worry about. But power is something that definitely can enhance your economy. And I've actually discovered that myself recently by um, strengthening my glutes and the power, like you said. So can you kind of explain how it's going to help with that? Something useful people can use? Yeah. So in in a runner, uh, power, particularly in the legs, um, it really manifests itself as as something else called stiffness. Um, and, And stiffness is a we all know what the word means on a colloquial level, but for a physicist, fit, fitness is a quality that springs have, and your legs function as springs uh, from a physics perspective when you run, and and the quality of stiffness refers to um, you, you, you've probably seen. Well, everyone knows what a slinky is, right? <laughs> like, I hope so. <laughs> like if, if you've got like a really old slinky that you've you know played with for years and it kind of gets loose. Um, it does, it doesn't work as well. Right. But when it's newer and stiffer, it's got more, more bounce to it. So that's how stiffness works. Or think of like a pogo stick. That's probably a a better example. It's got to be tight Mm -hmm. to give you a real bounce Mm -hmm. or, you know, like a a super ball, a super ball bounces really high because it's dense. 
And that's sort of an equivalent of, of stiffness. So if you build power in your legs, uh, what that allows you to do is, um, you know, like think about like plyometrics exercises, jumping exercises. When you land, if, you, if you've built up power in your legs, you're able to land more stiffly. You're sort of able to lock up your joints. And, and what happens then is, when, you know, when you land, your, your leg sends energy into the ground. That energy bounces right back up into your legs. And when you're running, inevitably, some of that energy that bounces back up into your legs from the ground is lost. Mm -hmm. But the stiffer your leg is, the less of that energy is lost. So then you can send it right back into the ground, and it's basically free energy for for forward propulsion. So someone who doesn't have as much power in their legs, they're going to land a little more like a wet noodle. And (laughs) it's not necessarily something you would see with the naked eye. But it just takes your your uh, muscles a little longer to kind of lock down and keep those joints from going wobbly because you know that's where the energy will dissipate. Um, but if so, if you improve your stiff stiffness, you kind of land nice and tight. The energy bounces back into the ground and and you go you go off it like a like a pogo stick. Uh, huh. So that's kind of how that all works. And how would someone develop that? Is that through the lifting or is that through you know doing some strides or sprints or how would they develop that power to improve that stiffness yeah i mean there are a million million ways i mean running itself will do it the faster you run the better it works um but kind of the the best bang for your buck comes from plyometrics so you know jump jumping jumping type exercises you know it doesn't have to be anything fancy like you know part of that 25 minute work circuit workout that i mentioned i do uh, i do one plyo exercise it's just single leg box jumps or you know with an aerobic step i Mm -hmm. stand on my right foot leap up on it leap back down do that 12 times do it again with the, the left leg. Uh, if I did a little bit more, could I get a little bit more out of it? Yes, but it's way better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, great. Well, that's that's good to know. And uh, can you give us any insight into your uh, book that is coming out at the end of the year? Are you allowed to tell us about that, or would you kind of rather keep it under wraps? Or just give us a summary, I guess. Of- oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind at all. It's uh, <laughs> pre-promotion or, or whatever. Uh, so, yes, and, and thank you for asking. Uh, it's called How Bad Do You Want It? Uh, the subtitle, this could change because publishers always, they're, they will fiddle with it. But the, <laughs> <laughs> the subtitle is uh, Mastering the Psychology of Mind Over Muscle. Okay. Um, so it's really, you know, it's about, it's a, it's a sports psychology uh, book that's specific to endurance sports. There, there are a lot of sports psych books out there, but there's never... Endurance sports are unique. It's just, you know, uh, the mental challenges of our sport are just nothing like those of tennis. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So you, and, and there's a lot going on, especially with the, the brain-based uh, research and insights where we're kind of learning how mind and body are connected through the brain. Um, so it's got, a, it's got some, a, a fair amount of science in there, but it's narratively based. So in each chapter, I talk about a true story involving usually a household name type of endurance athlete, not just runners, but also triathletes, cyclists. Okay. Um, there's even rowers in there. So it's um, some story where a, a, a great athlete faced a great challenge and overcame it and sort of demonstrated some type of fundamental coping skill. Uh, or, or ingredient of mental fitness, and then I sort of weave the science in to explain kind of how the whole thing works and how you can, uh, you as you know a non-elite endurance athlete um, can kind of do do the same thing that that household name athlete was able to accomplish. Okay, and can you share any of the? Was there one in particular, or a few that you found uh, especially interesting, or something someone can take away with today that they might be able to use in a you know upcoming race? Yeah, so um, you know, among the the running stories in there, uh, there's one about Jenny Simpson, the mm-hmm. former Jenny Berenger. Um, you know, some people listening might remember that in the 2009 NCAA Cross Country Championship, Jenny then Jenny Berenger was already the most accomplished female college runner ever. And when she went into the national cross country championship that year, she was a prohibitive favorite to to destroy every not just win but just kill everyone yeah. she, she ended up collapsing halfway through the race um and got eventually got up and finished like 136th or something and that was her last race as a college runner you know the greatest college runner yeah. ever 136 and 
that was a completely mental thing. There was, um, and you know, the, the whole port postmortem after that, you know, people wondered what the heck is wrong with her. Nothing was wrong with her. So it was just incredibly dramatic. And, you know, Jenny Simpson is not a mental weakling at all. <laughs> uh, right. So it's like, you know, if this sort of thing can happen to her, like if, if a completely like mental uh, issue can cause a runner of her statue to just fall face down, <laughs> you know what I mean? With nothing physically wrong with her, just like that's powerful. Yeah, and oh, yeah. but she was able to overcome it and become a world champion, just, yeah. you know, just uh, a year later, which is incredible. So that to me, it's just, it's so dramatic. Um, and so I, I, you know, I try to retell that story in a way that, uh, you know, has a, a sort of a war story page turning element to it, even if yeah. you know kind of how it ends up. But also I think really getting into like the science of, you know, exactly what happened there. Um, you know, you know, why, you know, why did it happen and, and how was she able to overcome it and how can other runners, uh, cause the issue that really faced her, I won't get too any further into it, but the issue she faced is something we all face, you know, um, you know, this, it's a, it's a universal experience. And I think that's another thing. That's another reason I wrote the book is that there's a tendency to think that great endurance athletes kick butt because they're super talented and they train super hard. And, and guess what? It's not all that. Like the mental side is just as important. Just, what, the way I put it is this. Imagine yourself on the starting line of the Boston Marathon and you're expected to win. You're expected to win. Think about what that would do to you. Well, guess what? The person who is actually standing on the starting line of the Boston Marathon and is expected to win feels exactly the way you would. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, so, you know, it takes – tremendous mental fitness to to succeed at that level so i want to know how they do it you know you know so we well we all care about getting better so just as you know elite athletes follow the 80 20 rule and guess what it works for us as well the mental things uh, that work for the best athletes in the world will also work for us as well so that's kind of the that that's the idea behind that book oh that sounds wonderful i actually i'm kind of a bit uh, mad now that we have to wait such a long time to uh read it because that's that sounds fascinating and I, i'm so so glad you brought that up and i that's something i'm really passionate about um in my own personal blog i write often about my um my failures my meltdowns my you know things that go wrong and you know every like you said it, it does it can be easy to see things always going right and especially in the the social media world we live in where people want to you know promote what's going well for them but are often afraid to put what's going you know the the, the failures or the the things that do go wrong so I think that will be a great read for people to see that um yeah everyone goes through these mental issues and everyone has those moments where you doubt yourself and it's you know it's how to overcome them and learning it from other inspiring stories so that sounds like a wonderful book and I I really look forward to reading it um towards the end of the year um so that's all the questions I had for today uh Matt but I just have one more that um I ask all my guests uh you, I don't think you did this before but um if you could give me one word to describe what you would like to become accomplish or achieve in this year in 2015 what would it be and why uh. <laughs> one word uh most difficult question of the interview right <laughs> yeah um this is a year of reaching for me Great so word. i'm all about if it's one word uh I, I i am reaching this year and i hope that when we talk again that i'll be able to say that that i achieved just that yeah, I like that. I like that. So um, what's the, the best way for people to follow what you're up to uh, in the next coming months? And uh, what date did you said the book is out at the end of the year? Do you have a date yet? I don't have a, a date. So some probably somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay, so a great that. Christmas present for people. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, I can tell you the the manuscript due date is tax day, April 15th. That's okay. the one that's the one I'm <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not sure that's gonna that's gonna help our listeners. But, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, sorry. What was the? So you have your website, which is mattfitzgerald dot com. Uh, dot org. Dot org. Okay. Some, some other some other clown got dot com. <laughs> Matt Fitzgerald's out there. Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, I am on Twitter. Okay. Uh, uh, Matt Fit Writer at Matt okay. Fit Writer. Okay. Uh, and you can find me on Facebook too. 
Okay, so yeah, there you go. There's your ways of keeping in touch with Matt and everything we have talked about today will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC54. So um, I encourage you to check that out to um, look at the links. And um, I would like to thank you, Matt, for coming on the show. It has been uh, wonderful to talk to you and I've really learned a lot. And uh, I know our listeners uh, and readers love anything that you come up with. So I'm sure the, the next book will be just as big as a success as the other ones have been. Well, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you. And there it is. The only guests on the Runners Connect to Run to the Top podcast that's been on three times, and I could have him on a fourth. We probably will, actually, thinking about it. The topics from today's episode, as well as the links to Matt's books, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc54. And if you have not already, I would encourage you to go back to listen to Matt's previous podcast episodes with us. Again, those will be at the same link. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would really appreciate if you could leave us a review on iTunes. On the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc54 or any of the other podcasts that we have done recently, there is a video demonstration of how to do just that. It would really help us rise up the rankings in iTunes to reach our goal of being the number one running podcast. If you really enjoy it, I know you will want to share it with others and we would really appreciate if you could help us grow. Thank you so much in advance. Have a great week.